Gary is saying this is really amazing. It's really amazing. Well, there we are. There we are. <laughs> good. Good morning, Mr. Hoffman. You're looking good in your leather jacket. Could, Mr. You, could you hear him snoring last No, we couldn't hear him snoring. He didn't snore a bit when I was with him. Hey, how you doing? Oh, are you guys going up to the snow? Hey, man. Brother. It's not like 20 blowout. Well, you know, I don't Oh, there you go. My battery's dying, so oh. I like those gloves. Yes, they look good. Here we are at the Vagabond Hotel in downtown, close to the airport, San Jose. It's never been published. Oh. Maybe put a box of it out, people can pay. Of course. Oh, all right. Um, and it was <laughs> it was because um, uh, I think it was an avant-garde journal uh -huh. that expected me to do something oh, that, I see. that Harry would be the yeah. hippiest hippie of all, oh, you know. Yeah. And instead I put him in squarely in the ranks of the Greek revival. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And the article was never published. Oh, so. it didn't have the right uh, uh, That's right. promo material. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So oh. I had that, but I yeah. I was asked to simply repeat my address from yeah, that's fine. Harvey well, Mudd. Yeah, that's fine. That's All right. Just fine. <laughs> that's fine. Of course, lots has happened since then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what's what's the status of your home in the desert? Is that it's ever? complete? It's beautiful. It's much admired. And uh, tomorrow morning, you buy a, uh, a chronicle. Oh. There's a big piece about it. Oh, with wonderful. Big yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Oh, okay. In the, in the magazine. Section. And you're going to be living there? Uh, no, it's a getaway place. Oh, Danley, I've actually. been living on the coast yes. since 1954. Yeah. yeah. And it's no wonder that I have emphysema and bronchitis yes. and asthma and everything else. I see. Also, I am tired of fog and mildew <laughs> and bronchitis. <laughs> So when you moved to Minnesota, it was a getaway me. place. Yeah. And uh -huh. the high desert was there. Yeah. So Joshua Tree is, yeah. is 3,000 feet. And yeah. You, you know where my getaway place is? No. Uh, Joke Jakarta or Solo? Oh, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. But that's hot. <laughs> <laughs> However, in certain seasons, yeah. it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, good for you. That's my, that's my that's spiritual home. Have. That's why I have that yeah. on. Yeah. 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 Where do you stay? Uh, well, uh, someday. I'm going to rent a big house, either in Joe Jakarta or so, and hire a gamelan and a dance company, and and I'm going to be a, a sunan. You're going to be part of the manor. I will yeah. be, yeah. and I'll have these people performing for me. All right, good for you. <laughs> to, to help encourage them and to keep them going. Sure. Yeah, I know. You know, because yeah. all this stuff is fast disappearing. I know. There was a there was a company, <laughs> Joe Jakarta. You've probably seen there was a company in downtown Joe Jakarta had a little theater and they were they did things. They're gone. I guess the, they? the teacher was okay. gone. And, and, uh, and that hotel just outside the Arlinga? Of Georgia? Yeah. The Arlinga. I guess so. The Arlinga. Yeah. Puck Chokro's got a nice he place now. Palace, yeah. Yeah. And he's got everything in place, I think, to do um, a 
seminar, I mean, not seminars, but workshops and things yeah. like that with yeah. students. But, yeah. but he's not a young boy anymore. No, I know. Yeah. So, yeah. But he's going on to try and convey things that he's afraid might get lost. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so you're a gambling player? Yeah. Good for you. Well, what's your favorite post? Yes, pardon? What is your favorite post? post. Oh, I like them all. Uh, I played everything. Uh, let's see, I played everything except uh, my gombong level right now is more of improvisation uh, yes. than knowing what the hell there, I'm doing. There are about 50 <laughs> ways of playing the gombong. <laughs> and then, I, I, then I want to get into uh, to suing too, mm -hmm. but I'm not there yet. Mm -hmm. I played everything else. Well, good, good. I'll begin there and so on. Yeah, and, and you know, Lou, when you enter heaven, that's the music you're going to hear. Yes, I'm sure it is. Exactly. <laughs> and you might, just, you might be asked to take Bill in on taking you. And in fact, when you get into heaven, I don't know what's there yet, but I'm sure there's, there's Lou Harris and, and Harry Parks and, and lots all of the Mahler. Of us, all the little <laughs> friends. <laughs> but it's Javanese music that's going to bring you in. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I'm going to leave, leave you to your thoughts. I'm going to wander around. Okay, fine. Yeah, I'm bye -bye. good to see you bye again. Good to see you. Yeah. Bye. Yeah, you say make sure tonight. Parking pass for David. Do you have any? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think I think I've got a large one. All right. So hopefully. Just a note. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Stanley, tell us, tell us what we're doing here. We are going to document the pamphleteering of Hoffman and Mitchell. Where, where are we right now? We're in the middle of San Francisco at the Haight Ashbury District, the district made famous by many um, rock and rollers, whatnot. So let's go on our journey. Okay, Danley, explain what happened at the site here. We set posters up here and we lost them. Someone tore them down within one, within one half an hour. Here we have Mr. Huffman resting after a hard day of pamphleteering. We became pamphleteers today. That's right. Here we are sitting in a coffee shop right out of Haines Street. <laughs> the pamphleteering center of the universe. <laughs> Where are we, Mr. Hoffman? Today uh, is Saturday uh, afternoon and we are in Berkeley, California. We are standing at the former site of People's Park and we are about to go on Telegraph Avenue to pamphleteer, continuing our pamphleteering. So let's go. Let's go. I get, that's probably a memorial. There it is. That's a memorial to People's Park right there. Nixon. Nixon. There's LBJ. Yes. There's Reagan. Yeah, there's Ronnie. There's Mario Savio. Uh, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. My God. It is. Amoeba. Up, up here is classical? That's right. Oh, wow. There you go. Looks good. Oh, geez, that's great. Oh, it's still good. Come on. 
Sorry. Here we are at uh, use at uh, University of California Berkeley's Sather Gate. And then we have our pamphleteer Randy Hoffman putting up pamphlets and uh, posters for the Harry Part Centennial at San Jose State University. at the Berkeley campus. Would you like to state that again, Mr. Hoffman, about your philosophy of pamphleteering? Yes, we, we have learned uh, in the last couple of days that uh, we have developed the most precise founding system in the uh, Bay Area pamphleteering, and we, we do it uh, the way Harry would. We make it a visual, a visual Co A corporeal, art. ritualistic right. event. That's right. It's a ritualistic, corporeal, visual event. Good. Do you want me to scale with green or black? Uh, oh, yeah. 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 Did you use it all by hand? Hi, Mom. You. Oh. <laughs> That's hot. Jack Carrick Street. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're huge. Uh, There's Mr. Hoffman at Jack Carroll. That's, that's Jack Carroll act. That's not, that's not Jack, Randy Hoffman. We're running the store here. Let's go in and see if we can put a poster in. Rolling. We're rolling, yeah. Here we have the, we have the famous City Lights bookstore on Jack Kerouac Street in, in Corso Cristofor Colombo. There's a John Steinbeck novel right here in front of us. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Let's get some let's get some dinner.
Step forward, please. <laughs> That's the important thing about life is the documentation of it. Hi. How are you guys doing? Oh, we're doing fine, thanks. Yeah? Yeah. Kind of. Danley did. I stayed up kind of late. I feel great. Yeah. We had dinner. Frank. a good close-up shot. <laughs> what else did you do today? Well, we pamphleteered in the East Bay for the entire day. Wow. We actually uh, finished up at City Lights. Uh -huh. uh, what's the final posters? And actually, I brought you guys a few posters too to leave with you. So our day became elongated. Yeah. We're here to interview Frank. We're here to interview. He gets the camera then goes, we are? Frank Darby, okay. about the influence of Harry Parch and the Grateful Dead in his creative output. Mostly the creative, mostly the, the Grateful Dead. European biased music. Mm -hmm. Then it became, and, and one of the means for that happening was Harry Parch, which I, who I think was the greatest composer of the 20th century. And, and the bridge to a creation of a new kind of language in music, which is this giant fusion music, this polyfusion of everything. And when, when music, which came out of the different roots music of all the working class cultures, became, for the first time in the history of the world, the dominant musical language of the world. When, it became, when, came? when working class music oh, yeah. became the dominant musical language of the world mm -hmm. for the first time in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. In yeah. our lifetime. Yeah, yeah. Right. That happened in our lifetime. That's true. And, and that yeah. was driven by people that were roughly our age. I exactly. Mean, yeah. And that's a historically important phenomenon. And when that happened, it only took one generation for it to go from, you know, um, well, it took several waves, which started like 30 year cycle waves, which started with like slave music and Celtic folk musics and stuff in the 19th century. But then these waves culminated in jazz, which was a gigantic intellectual achievement, extending harmonic structures beyond classical music, mm -hmm. and rhythmic structures were enlivened. And then the next wave, of it, in my opinion, was psychedelic rock, which took it to the level of this, uh, by, by actually, ironically, by adding influence from Western European classical, that adding a respect for that kind of structural development, that the long form is what you call it, like 20, 30 minute, 40 minute compositions, like a Beethoven symphony. By adding that, combining it with the power of the working class roots music, which is like collective improvisation mm -hmm. and so on like that, by doing that fusion, it, it achieves this level of greatness that is like Beethoven or something. And then there was a, a downturn in the cycle and a disappointment to me at the time as it consolidates and it becomes like, you know, too much back based on the roots again instead of being this new thing that was this long-form epic. And then one of the roots that they fell back on was country. And that's cool, you know, I, I don't diss any of the roots, but you got to combine them all to make the, you know, all the, all the, all the rivers feed the ocean. Yeah. And it's the ocean that I was more interested in. Well, but then I also go, need to go back to the roots. I mean, we always need to go yeah. back to the roots to get refreshed. Yeah. Just like that's why the rivers are there. So we go back to the to country, we go back to... Uh, what they call mountain music, bluegrass. A lot of people mm -hmm. are fascinated with that right now. We always go, these are always around, ready for us to go back and dip into them again because yeah. we'll always need them again. But it's really, it's really, they justify their continuing existence when they feed a fusion, which is a new thing and which has the same level of emotional and intellectual power as like any of the great classical yeah. achievements of art. Because that's what you need to express the, the breadth of the human experience. Yeah. You can't express the whole breadth of the collective human experience in the more limited roots type form. Well, I, I think you're selling. I think you're selling those forms a little short there, though, because you know, isn't 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 country rock? Isn't that a fusion? Well, every everything's a fusion of some kind. Yeah. Or other, but I mean, well, when when a, when a, when a young kid. Uh, and, and, and these kids were, you know, these guys who were working on this stuff, uh, you know, like uh, the, the Flying Burrito Brothers and, and, and the original lineup of that band Poco and these, these groups that I used to see a lot, you know, when they would take 
a pedal steel guitar and pump it through a Leslie speaker. Isn't that a fusion? Yeah, but see, what I'm talking about <laughs> is the thing that happens. And play like motherfuckers, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Those guys. <laughs> what I'm talking about you know. is the thing that can happen when you start out telling a story at 8 o'clock in Bali or in Africa or at a Grateful Dead show or at the Omni Circus at 8 o'clock in the evening and then you finish telling the story at 5 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the morning or something and you've had a chance to send the audience through this gigantic emotional arc mm -hmm. that you can't do in a three minute song. I'm not talking about you know that that song isn't valid or that the fusion isn't there. I'm just saying that there's something additional you get from the long form. If you can well, make yeah, a dramatic oh, yeah, arc. Yeah, yeah, there's something about it that represents that. the human body and the human story, the human life. A song, in my view, represents an individual human life. And a symphony or a, sim or a long form represents the, the life of a community. See, that's, mm -hmm. that's my personal view. That the rituals and mythologies of the individual are represented in the song form. That's why it exists. But the rituals and mythologies of the organism, which is called a society, is represented in the long form. That's why the movie is longer than the, you know, whatever. <clears throat> so, and, and working class music achieved this level of epic proportion. In, in our lifetime. And then it goes sort of back and forth, and there's an oscillation, there's a struggle. There's a struggle against it. There are forces that oppose that. That like to want to put out, di you know, put across punk or disco or something to, to downgrade the level of cultural development of the working class. Like disco empties out the, the rhythmic complexity of, pro of progressive music. Mm -hmm. And it reduces it to a mind numbing thump. And uh, punk music empties out the harmonic complexity of working class music and reduces it to a two chord crunch. And uh, um, maybe uh, rap music, uh, there's no melodic complexity, there's no melody, so it reduces it. So uh, there's these forms that reduce. And then there's the counter offensive, where progressive musicians go into these forms and they they sort of disguise themselves with them, and then they make it more complex again, and make it more large form again. Like when, uh, say, Mr. Bungle, or Captain Beefheart, or somebody, or Frank Zappa, disguises himself as a, um, uh, you know, three chord uh, punk rocker, but they're really pu putting out something that's much more complex than that. <clears throat> so it's a back and forth, like a battle, like a civil war battle. Where, where one one year it's like batteries going here I think in Go the ahead. 70s it was like disco was winning and. <laughs>